Thanks for the intro. Uh, we're Teyush and we're digital designers and art directors, which means that we're rarely caught without a piece of technology in our hands. And this is the perfect example. This is us on a holiday. We usually work for clients from fashion and entertainment industry. Uh, however, we wouldn't be able to attract those clients if it wasn't for the innovative approach we present through self-initiated projects. And basically, through self-initiated projects, we try to, to show clients how they can use new mediums and new languages and be bolder and respond uh, to, uh, creatively to the changes happening in digital era. We can easily spot the technological advancements and laugh at the old tech. What is harder to spot are the gradual changes in ourselves and in the society caused by technology. Well, actually, this one is not that hard to spot. This is a picture from China, where they made a separate lane for people who are on their phones. And as you know, there are so many things that we take as a norm nowadays, but would be completely mind-blowing only 15 years ago. For example, we are used to receiving information real time. We uh, can shop and socialize behind the screen. We rely on Google to know everything that pops in our mind. And that is why we often feel more secure with smartphone in our pocket rather than a person by our side. And the list goes on and on. And in our work, we like to draw attention to these gradual changes in order to analyze what we as a society are adapting to. Sound. <laughs> Sound. Uh. Okay. Can we play it again? Or okay. So today we're going to talk about how digital technology redefines and influences communication between us, our ability to focus, what we dream of and our subconscious, and how it even attempts to challenge our reality. When we first got intrigued into how technology is changing our communication was when we moved to Netherlands, and then, of course, maintained contact with friends through social networks. And then what we soon discovered is that we were able to have whole conversation about what people were doing, where they were going, and even how they expressed themselves, only based on what they shared online. At the time, I was reading a psychology book by Eric Byrne called Games People Play. And it led me to think about the psychological games that people play in the online environment where we cannot see each other's body language and where our communication is limited because of already predefined interface design. By the way, this is, uh, these are the images from the first work we're going to show. And uh, as the interface design changes, uh, so does the way we communicate. For example, we became proficient at expressing a very specific emotion through uh, memes or filters. <laughs> and sometimes it's such a specific thing that we wouldn't be able to put it in any other way. Because of Twitter, we learned to summarize our thoughts in 140 characters. And like on autopilot, we keep captioning our photos the moment we take them. So ultimately, um, interface design is changed by society's needs, and it is changing the society. And which one is the chicken and which one is the egg in this situation is hard to tell. So we started uh, the project called Dictionary of Online Behavior, which is the online dictionary of new words that we invented and that describe phenomena emerged on social networks. Uh, each word in this, in this dictionary is presented through explanation and through example of how the word can be used in a sentence. And this part is very similar to traditional dictionaries. But also each word is presented through a short GIF-like animated video as a popular internet form. Now we are going to show some of the examples of the words from the dictionary. Have seen. It's when uh, somebody sends you a message but you don't feel like replying straight away, so you just uh, have a peek at the beginning of the message and then maybe assume the rest, maybe you don't. 
but you don't want to open it all the way because then the other person might get this little scene at the end of the message and then you might be per perceived as rude for not replying. And for us, this, this phenomenon was particularly interesting because it's actually a very small UX, UI adjustment, basically, that created this pressure in society to, to be available all the time and to reply to messages instantly. So, in a way, it changed the, the culture of texting, but ultimately it's only a small change in the interface. And another word is forcey. Uh, which is a selfie that you don't voluntarily take part, but you're forced by someone's enthusiasm. <laughs> and I guess we've all been in this situation one time or another. And while we were working on, on the word forcey, selfie was actually uh, announced as the word of the year by Oxford Dictionary, so we kind of knew it was a hot topic. And follower ratio is the ratio of followers to followings. Do you want to be followed or do you want to be a follower? Bear with me, and I will teach you how to reach that perfect follower ratio. You have to show interest in others. So just like, 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 comment, 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 and follow, follow, follow. Once you get people to follow you back, reverse it. Just unfollow, unfollow, unfollow. It's that easy. Believe me, you'll go from an average person to an influencer in a month. So what we showed in this uh, satirical explainer is a strategy that we find so interesting because it is so generic, yet it relies on basic human traits, such as showing back the interest. And that is why we used the, the aesthetics of a trashy generic ad and made it awkward by putting it in a very human, everyday perspective. But to go back to the beginning, at the beginning we were still figuring out how to construct our observations. We wanted to, to write down these new rules that were imposed by social media, and then we started writing down modern proverbs. And example of one of them is, is if a picture is worth a thousand words, then Instagram account with a thousand pictures is worth a million. And yes, you're right, we're actually quoting ourselves here. That's the level of narcissism emerged from social networks. So um, in which form should this project be? At some point, we decided to make a website out of it. And since we were showing this new social context from the perspective of the old one, we needed to find a design element that will be a good metaphor for this transition from the old to the new and back. Uh, most of the dictionaries online are actually a digitized version of the old book. But since we were uh, making a dictionary um, that is not about digitization, but about digitalization, we uh, wanted to reinvent the form of a dictionary in the online world. So we took tab as a perfect element. Tabs are what people used earlier to archive, organize, and write the old dictionaries. And tabs are what is constructing our window to the internet world today. So we started this project five years ago. And at that time, these were the initial sketches for the website that we wanted to make. So we had some struggles. And UX, UI was definitely one of them. Uh, the problem was at that time we didn't know a single line of code. And another problem was uh, we had no budget. After a couple of months, uh, after attending a developing course, um, we already had a few enthusiasts about the project around us. So with the help of a friend, we were able to code this website uh, ourselves, which was a huge step forward at the time. And it is always so nice having supportive people around, but we had even more people who were constantly proposing to open a Facebook page or a Tumblr page instead for this project and solve our struggles easily. But easy was not the aim. This project is not only about the words, it is about the internet culture. And visuals and the UX and UI represent so much in this culture. And after publishing this project, even in this form, it gained a lot of attention. Uh, it was granted a fund, so we were able to take part of it and make uh, the website uh, as it is now. Um, so we redesigned it, and Atro Studio, who are now sitting in the audience, uh, developed it. Uh, so there are 25 words online, and uh, while working on, on this uh, website, we had a lot of decisions to make. So even though we didn't follow any rules, we did have some problems to solve. 
So now I'm going to uh, pose some of the, of the problems that we encountered along the way, and Sophia will uh, introduce the solutions, because that's how we roll. So the first problem was how to get people interested in, in the words, so how to make people um, interested in the words that they basically cannot relate to, so how to make them click and find out more about uh, the words. Uh, the second problem was the visual coherence of the website, because we make uh, different animations for each word, and we also invite other creatives to, to make uh, visuals for words. So the question was how to, to make visually coherent uh, the project with so many different visual styles. And the third problem was the balance between text and visuals. Although uh, the text is at the core of this project, we didn't want visuals to be the mere illustrations of the, of the text. Uh, we wanted uh, visuals to be very expressive and very immersive because, in a way, visual language is the branding of, of the whole project. So, for the first problem, we did two things. We made a visual teaser and we gave a short explanation. So if someone gets interested by this uh, preview, they can click and find out more about the word. The second problem we solved by putting a rather general uh, visual style of the home page to which we can easily implement uh, different visuals. And also only one visual is visible at a time, so they are never juxtaposing. And the third problem we solved by a cursor. So once you enter the word, uh, you can click anywhere. The, the visual is full screen, and you can click anywhere on the screen to get the explanation. And then second click will give you the examples. And these can be also removed at any point. And at some point, we decided to, to invite other creatives to work on us, with us on this project. And it was important for us to do so because it's actually the perspective of all of us around this topic, uh, because we are one of the last generations that are actually not digital natives. And for us, it's always very good to see how new words live and how people actually use hashtags. For example, I often take forces with my cat, and then later on we discovered that many other people do so as well. Or with their grandmas. So if you don't have any takeaways after this talk, at least you can enrich your hashtags vocabulary. So what we noticed is that technology also changed ourselves and our habits. Among other things, we noticed that our attention span got shorter. We noticed that we are, as well as people around us, highly intolerant to boredom. We are very much used to sensationalism and stimuli for all of our senses. We get easily immersed in the online environment and have a hard time maintaining in our immediate environment, which is often slower and less stimulating than the online one. We jump from a tab to a tab and we constantly check our phones. So, um, even though, on, on the other hand, uh, we would never give up the perks of technology. For some people, the solution is uh, in going back to the old phones. But for us, this meant we should be starting a new project. And then uh, we googled our assumptions, and this is what popped out. Humans have shorter attention span than goldfish. So we thought this must be the proof. Technology did make us distracted. It exists on Google, plus it matches our personal point of view, so it must be true, right? This is how we think nowadays. But then I started wondering, how the fuck <laughs> can they measure the attention span of the goldfish? And it turned out that this is one of many sensationalistic clickbait titles. <laughs> so very ironically, the, the title about short-term attention span was actually designed so that it grabs your attention. So we live uh, in the era of attention economy, uh, which is a more complex subject, and we, we will leave it to other professionals to talk about that. But we want to observe how technology, design, and social media uh, facilitate this problem. So now the boring part. <laughs> uh, here's a, a background of distra distractions. Uh, this is Skinner's box. And Skinner was a psychologist who introduced the concept of variable rewards. So pigeons were uh, trained to peck at the target, and when they did so, they would get food. Uh, but the first group of pigeons would get food after every response, while the second group of pigeons 
would get food only after a random amount of packing, and it would also be a random amount of food. So what happened is that the first group uh, would only pack when they were hungry, while the second group would pack much more often. And as it turns out, the mere anticipation of getting the reward releases the dopamine in our brain and makes us do the thing that got us the reward before much more often. So does it sound familiar? This is how the apps are built. We check our phones on average 150 times a day, and sometimes we get notifications. And sometimes these notifications are likes and nice comments, while sometimes they're just annoying reminders for the events that we don't want to go to. So for this reason, we initiated the project Attention Spam. And one of the inspirations for the project Attention Spam was the modern proverb, sitting is the new smoking. And we decided to put it literally in a form of a cigarette warning label. So while we are online, we are immersed and distracted. And we so often for forget about our physical bodies, which leads to hours of sitting with the scattered thoughts. Uh, and there are many apps that try to warn about this problem, such as Calm and Budify. But we wanted to propose a solution outside of digital technology, the, the one that will stand actually in our immediate environment. So we decided to make a collection of physical objects, and we designed fashion uh, for our clothes, ourselves, and our phones. So we teamed up with a brand, Print All Over Me, from New York, uh, who made this collection happen. And Today, also, we brought some gifts with us, which we want to give to some of you. So now I'm going to do a short test. And please answer the following questions truthfully, and no need to raise your arm just yet. So uh, I can't remember the last time I spent a day completely off the phone. Is this true for you? Yes or no? I checked my phone at least once during this talk. Of course, this depends also on how amusing we are. <laughs> but that aside, uh, is this true for you? Uh, how many of you uh, how many of you answered positively to both questions? Please raise your hand. Well. Okay, <laughs> a lot. Um, okay, so for those of you who answered positively, an extra question. I want to change the habits around digital devices. So if you answered positively to all three, uh, please come find us after the talk, and we have a couple of phone stickers to give, and hope you will be the one. <laughs> <laughs> so we find this uh, part, uh, we find uh, this to be the most critical part of our relationship to technology, and we sincerely hope by wearing attention spam collection that we can, in a fun way, remind ourselves and people around us uh, that focus is actually a limited and valuable human resource. So we talked about how technology is changing our communication and our habits. And since it shapes so much of our conscious life, it does affect our subconscious as well. Maybe we don't realize it until we start feeling anxiety because the battery on our phone is dead, or until we, we start dreaming, but instead of dreaming about the offline life, we dream about the embarrassing photo that ended up on our Instagram account. So some time ago, uh, we made uh, the titles for Playgrounds Festival, and this is what we depicted. We made uh, three surreal rooms, very dreamlike, built out of digital elements. And when we pass through the last room, all the elements from the previous rooms are collapsing because the dream is coming to an end. And here is the video. expected, because we are still figuring out how digital is actually becoming our reality. So we talked about how changing the interfaces is changing our everyday life, basically our reality. But uh, technology is also literally uh, attempting to challenge the reality, and that is through VR, AR and MR. 
VR has been announced as the game changer, but the reality is that so far it has mostly changed games, I mean the gaming industry. Although the technology is very powerful, uh, there are certain obstacles that are keeping VR away from success initially anticipated. Today, still not enough people own VR headset, which means that stakeholders are very skeptical when it comes to investing in VR. And for creatives, it is challenging because it requires thinking about time and space rather than designing for a flat screen. The first VR that we worked was for kids. We were hired by Cinekid Media Lab, which is an amazing uh, festival here in Amsterdam that actually introduces uh, cutting-edge technology to kids. So uh, we decided to make uh, a joyful VR ride through different environments and to implement the language of social media uh, in it. Uh, so we took digital symbols and placed them in the form of bananas. Uh, so that they're organic part of the VR environment, like they're organic part of today's children's lives. And as you know, uh, experience stimuli in VR can be very joyful, but also very scary. So one of the main challenges for this project was actually to uh, find that line. So we tested a lot uh, on ourselves and on some very brave kids. And besides being creative, our biggest challenge on this project was uh, not to traumatize kids, of course. <laughs> <laughs> like here, for example, we recreated the poop emoji. And what we soon discovered is that uh, kids uh, have the ability to build fantastical elements if you sparkle their imagination. Uh, they're, so e they're already so easily altering the reality. So for us, it was interesting to see how they built on top of this experience and talk about the things that never actually happen in VR. So uh, children have this tendency to remember things from the past that never actually happened or, or that are exaggerated. Uh, so it made us wonder about the, the influence VR can have on kids and if they will remember something experienced in VR as real. It is the first time in history that a designer can uh, design an entire environment, a new reality. And as you know, VR has been used in many medical studies uh, to cure phobias, PTSD and similar uh, neurological conditions. So with that in mind, the question is, how big is the responsibility of a designer when creating content for VR? And are we equipped to do it? Can we accidentally make a wrong or hurtful experience? So to summarize, uh, we talked about how we use technology on a daily basis and how this relationship changed us. But most importantly, it inspired us to create the work we did and helped us share it with like-minded people. We have a whole new world of possibilities in front of us. We can allow ourselves to think differently about uh, our offline and online surroundings and to uh, experiment with new mediums. We can create new dictionaries and new realities. And it is a perfect ground to push the boundaries of concepts and aesthetics and we will continue introducing brands to these innovative strategies that we discover. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all for your attention.